Welcome to Louisiana Business Spotlight. I'm Jeff Cruer. Great program lined up for you today. We're going to be talking about a business here in Kenner that is growing by leaps and bounds. And also an expert on health care, going to sort of navigate the sort of uncertainty of Obamacare for individuals and business. But let's start with some of the top business stories we're following right here on Louisiana Business Spotlight. Part-time employment has surged in recent months, highlighting both the tentative nature of the long, slow economic recovery and the changing dynamics of work. Through July, according to the Labor Department statistics, the number of people working part-time in the U.S. grew four and a half times as fast as the number of full-time workers. And the share of all workers who mainly hold part-time jobs is now at levels not seen since the early 1980s. Women hold only 7.2% of corporate board seats and 13.6% of executive officer positions among most of the publicly traded companies based here in Louisiana. And those are the conclusions of a study unveiled by the Newcomb College Institute at Tulane University. The study was the first installment of what the Institute plans to become an annual barometer of female participation in high level roles in business. A study by the Associated Press, NORC Center for Public Affairs Research, finds that nine in 10 workers who are age 50 or older say that they are very or somewhat satisfied with their job. Older workers reported satisfaction regardless of gender, race, educational level, political ideology, or income level. Now the survey found an age gap as 38% of young adults expressed deep satisfaction compared with 63% those aged 65 and up. And finally, a bipartisan group of senators unveiled new legislation that would delay most flood insurance premium increases resulting from the 2012 Bigger Waters Law and would do it for four years. Now, the bill was developed by a geographically diverse coalition of eight senators, including Mary Landrieu and David Vitter, representing states such as Louisiana, which are affected by the law. Now, it was adopted by Congress back in 2012 to make the flood insurance program more fiscally sound. Now, supporters of the delaying legislation want to stop the insurance rate increases, which in some cases are 100% or 200% or even 1,000% higher. All right, coming up next, Lisa Rickard is going to be joining us. She is CEO, owner, of Annie Sloan Unfolded. That's right here on Louisiana Business Spotlight. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Very pleased to have with us a local success story He's on the verge of building an even bigger business based right here in Kenner. Pleased to have with us the CEO of Annie Sloan Unfolded. Lisa Rickard is with us here on Louisiana Business Spotlight. And Lisa, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate the invite to be here with you today. My pleasure. Uh, tell our viewers before we get started into your business, a little bit about who uh, Annie Sloan is. Sure, Annie Sloan is a world-renowned artist and author. Um, she has lived and worked in Oxford, England um, for about 30 years building a, um, a business in which she created her now famous decorative paint called chalk paint. Um, she actually developed the paint in 1990 um, and has been selling it as chalk paint since 2004. Um, I found her in late 2009, and I really felt like she was the best kept secret in Europe. So Now, before we get into how you connected with her, uh, tell us what, what is chalk paint? What is it? Chalk paint is a decorative paint, and it has um, very unique qualities in that it has ease of use and versatility that um, before the creation of her paint was not available. So to repurpose furniture or interiors, you don't need to prime or sand. So you can literally open the can of paint, shake and shake, then open the can of paint and just put it right on top of the surface. Um, the other beauty about chalk paint is its versatility. So you can use it to wash a wood grain if you want to preserve um, the look of maybe an oak mm -hmm. or a pine. 
and you can do single color applications, very modern finishes. You can even layer the colors to do more time age finishes. Um, and then with the use of its complementary product, the soft wax, you can even add some age and patina. So this is revolutionary, really. And, and yeah. what is the secret ingredient here that, that allowed this product to be so successful? Well, um, again, it's its ease of use and versatility. What really drew me in was the texture of the product. It mm. has a velvety matte finish, and that's why chalk paint really got its name. Um, so it's not so much about the ingredients mm -hmm. is, is what it can do. And so she named it chalk paint because it's suggestive of the finish. Um, it's one of the... Uh, misunderstandings in the marketplace that sometimes occurs is people think, oh, it's chalk paint, it must be paint with chalk in it. Right. Um, in fact, most paints that have a flat finish have some form of chalk in it already. Wow. So it's not necessarily its name that's indicative of the ingredient. So, boy, it makes it a lot easier when you're, you're dealing with furniture, when you're trying to, you know, decorate your house. Yes. Uh, it really is ease of use as well, right? It is. And so when Annie developed chalk paint, she was a mom that had three small boys and she really wanted a paint that you could finish the project and put it back within a day. You know, that you don't have the hustle and bustle of sanding and the laborious, you know, it, it puts the, the fun and, and joy back in painting. And with the economy and the recession, sure. you know, so many people are thinking about repurposing mm -hmm. their furniture um, as opposed to necessarily exactly. buying new. And we give them the tools and the education mm -hmm. um, to do that. So she's had a little success story in Europe, uh, been doing this for a while, yes. and you were sort of looking for a new business. How did you encounter this whole you know, idea? Um, I really wasn't looking for a new business. Um, my background is business. I have a degree in finance and a master's in business and was working for um, larger corporations based in New Orleans. Um, mainly in supply chain management. And my husband and I were rebuilding, or I should say building a home mm -hmm. in Lakeview, um, in an area that was heavily hurt by Hurricane Katrina. And I was really looking for inspiration and stumbled across Annie's book, um, Creating the French Look. And this book talks all about how you can paint furniture to give it this very authentic European style, which was exactly what I was looking for. Um, so after I came home and told my husband I'm painting all the furniture in the house and it's going to accomplish exactly what I want, um, I went off to find the paint and it was not available in the United States. So I imported my first six liters of chalk paint from her shop in the UK and fell in love with it. And I can tell you that the experience of creating these finishes mm -hmm. just by reading her books and understanding a bit about the techniques I was at awe with, you know, what so I could create. the books were available, but the, the books, paint was not. The books were available through major book, you right. know, through book chains. Right. Um, Seiko is the publisher, so it was in Barnes and Nobles and right. Borders. Um, so her books were available, but the paint was not. And Crazy. so I really felt like it was the best kept secret in Europe. And I fell so passionately in love with this paint that I had to have more, and I had to share it with... Um, with Americans. So you became a big cheerleader for this. You just said, well, I need more product. <laughs> then right. I need to just change my whole life. And you it, gave up your other job it, and you just I did. made this yeah, your full-time job. Uh, it, it was life-changing. I started out, you know, really with the goal of launching her brand here um, in the States. And mm. um, once it took off, you know, I wasn't able to keep up with two full-time jobs. I had my second child at the time. So I really had to make the decision as to what direction did I want to take my life and my career. And right. um, with this industry, it's so creative and there's so much um, sharing and collaboration amongst our stockists and customers that um, it really is a very fulfilling job for me. So when you first contacted her about this idea of yours mm -hmm. to sort of share her products with the United States, uh, how did she respond to that? Um, she was quite pleased. She had been trying to get into um, the U.S. market, I think, for two or three years at that time and just had not found the right person to act as the distributor. And I think the fact that I did not have an extensive art background actually was a big selling point for myself because it shows 
the general public that you don't have to be a trained artisan to use these products. It's really um, achievable by anyone. So you had an idea of sharing her products with people across this country. Yeah. How did you go about doing it? Well, we first started talking about um, what it would take, and she actually had already found a paint manufacturer here, um, Davis Paint, and mm -hmm. they are based in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and they have been making chalk paint here in the United States since we launched in mid-2010. Um, so we um, began our discussions, and I put together a marketing plan and started reaching out to our first group of customers. And I literally started this with three customers, um, one in Mississippi, one in North Carolina, and one in New Jersey. So your customers are... Our customers, we refer to them as stockists, and they are small, independent shops um, or art studios that specialize in interiors and design. Um, some could sell antique furniture, some could be more boutique and gifty. We really celebrate the unique qualities that make all of our stockists independent shops. So like Home Depot? No. no, we actually do not sell through big box stores. Okay. Um, our brand value and culture is really in support of small businesses. So how many different businesses do you supply now? Well, we are, we've extended beyond the United States now. Wow. Um, we currently uh, distribute for the United States, Canada, and we just started developing Australia and New Zealand. And so in total, I think I have 423 shops across those Fantastic. four countries that sell our products. Now, obviously, it's more than just you and your husband, so you've had to bring on other people, and yes. then your story brought you to Kenner, and let's talk about how that happened. Yep, so um, certainly, I call it my team has grown uh, quite significantly as our business has grown. Mm -hmm. um, my husband has a quite extensive distribution background and worked for his father's um, tile distribu distribution, which is mm -hmm. Rickert Tile, and um, so he has actually been instrumental in handling the operation side of the business, and I could not do it without him. Mm -hmm. um, since then, we have brought in my brother, Jason, who manages um, Australia. I have other friends and relatives that work for me. We're, we're now up to about 19 employees, and we all work out of our office in Kenner. And uh, and then how did you make it to Kenner? Well, we were looking for a distribution facility, and Kenner has this great um, industrial section right past the airport, mm -hmm. and it was perfect for what we needed at the time. Um, we were actually able to secure a property that had room for growth, which knowing the direction that our business was going was exactly what we needed. Um, so just about three months ago, we finished the expansion to our warehouse, which more than doubled our original size. Fantastic. And now we're eyeing up some property across the street that maybe we can get our hands so on. So it's further expansion. Further expansion, yes. Kenner will always be the home of our distribution facility. And again, we service all of North America out of that. Fantastic. Um, and our staff is growing so much that... Um, we're getting rather tight in our in our office space, so we'll be expanding that as well. Now let's talk about some of the fabrics, if we could, here. Yeah, so Annie Sloan, the brand, um, is not just about this fabulous decorative paint that I told you about, but we also sell fabrics, um, and we have more products in the pipeline to continue to add to the concept of design and interiors. Um, the fabric is actually all imported out of France and Belgium. Um, and we have some really wonderful tickings and twalls, and the twalls are actually double width, so they're perfect for doing um, like large window panels or bedding or even wall coverings. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really about having customers understand what is the style that they're going for, and then how can you use our products to incorporate that into your home. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, the education that we sure. provide to mm -hmm. our customers. Um, each of our stockists is actually well trained. They all go through um, a training facility, um, a two day training before they even get product in hand. Mm -hmm. And they all teach workshops. So if the books and the brochures and the, and the YouTube videos on Annie's um, YouTube channel was not enough to give them the information, they were really looking for that hands on experience, all of our stockists offer that. Mm -hmm. um, and we're actually, as we expand into new product lines, we are expanding our workshop selection so that they can think about 
decorating a room, you know, not just let me paint this piece of furniture, right. but I want to redo my living room. And these are the specs of the room. These are the colors I'm thinking. And the stockist can actually help incorporate and um, help make those decisions for those You've got some molding changes. here as well. Huh? Can you tell us about that? I do. I just brought a few pieces to kind of demonstrate how easy the paint is. And certainly um, these are rather small. Um, this is a frame that started out as just a gold gilded frame and you can actually paint any color chalk paint onto the surface mm -hmm. and when it's almost dry you wipe it back gently with a damp cloth and that brings through that original color. This technique takes about five minutes and you can update frames, mirrors, light fixtures, metal, you can really paint almost any surface um, with chalk paint. It's great for wood, but you can paint upholstery. Wow. You can actually paint fabric with it. Really? You can paint um, metal and concrete and exterior surfaces. And so it's- Talk um, about versatile. <laughs> talk about, ver now you know why I needed so much paint when I decided to redo my house. Um, there's some other moldings that I brought that really just kind of show um, a very popular finish and this is a two color distressed um, technique where you're painting on the base coat coming back with what this is a duck egg blue and then applying the clear wax. Mm -hmm. um, that's really going to give the paint durability for interiors and then gently sanding to bring that base coat through. And so. Um, some people really enjoy a kind of weathered distress finish. And That's popular now, isn't it? It is popular and it's so easy to achieve with our products. Mm -hmm. um, this one gets a little bit um, deeper in that this is meant not only to look like a two color distress, but a really aged finish. You know, this is something that you might find in a French Quarter home that right. has layers and layers of paint over an extended period of time. Now, can anybody buy from you directly or do they have to buy through I, your... I do um, not sell direct. I mm -hmm. really believe in supporting um, our small businesses. Right. Now, I do have two stockists locally in the greater New Orleans Tell area. Tell us about them if you could. Sure. Um, Jane Drew is in Lake Vista and she has Creative Finishes Studio. Mm -hmm. And she has a wonderful collection of painted furniture and she offers the workshops and a few gift items. Um, we also have Linfield Designs up on Maple Street, mm -hmm. and they also offer workshops and have some accessory painted items in there as well. Wow. So that's yeah. good. I'm glad you have some local. We do have some folks. local, mm -hmm. and um, we also have uh, several stockists on the North Shore. We have several in Baton Rouge. Right. Um, the best way to find our stockists is to actually visit AnnieSloanUnfolded.com. And tell us about. Okay, Annie Sloan unfolded. What was the uh, yes? So um, that? I used to operate as Jolie Design and Decor, and that was the name of my business when I first brought Annie Sloan products to the United States. And we started to feel like there was a bit of disconnect with consumers saying, "Well, why am I buying Annie Sloan products from Jolie Design?" So Annie and I had this quick brainstorming session. Mm -hmm. We said, "How can we better make the connection that I'm your main distributor in these territories?" And, you know, Annie is definitely a fan of small business and didn't want anything that sounded too corporate, per se. Um, so we didn't want to be Annie Sloan International or, you know, Annie Sloan Distributor. So we thought Unfolded was a great way to talk about what I'm doing. And that's really taking Annie Sloan Fantastic. that has lived in Oxford and unfolding her to the rest of And, and finally, uh, Lisa, country. have you had a chance to meet her? Has she come in? Oh, to absolutely. The States? Oh, she yes. has. Okay. Yeah. So Annie and I have developed quite a relationship over the last four years, and we bring her to the United States as often as we Great. can. Um, we've actually had U.S. tours. Um, she actually just finished a Canadian um, tour. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely, there should be opportunity for. Um, for our Fantastic. consumers to meet her at some point. Well, and we encourage viewers to go to the website to get more information about yes. maybe any upcoming appearances, that kind of thing, correct? Yes, upcoming okay. appearances, and then also reaching out to their local stockists as, as a resource for them. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Lisa, thanks so much. Thank uh, you for having this, me. Uh, great array Enjoyed of products. It. Congratulations on your success. Thank you. All right, when we come back, folks, plenty more. So keep it right here on Louisiana Business Spotlight.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. The big issue that we've been following for months now, Obamacare. What is it going to mean for individuals and businesses? Well, I've got an expert here. He's an independent health insurance agent. Greg Reinhardt is with us here on Louisiana Business Spotlight. And Greg, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Greg, your business has probably been thrown upside down by Obamacare, hasn't it? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I mean, a lot of changes. Uh, a lot of things we have to prepare for, and then these issues with the website do not help. Let's start by, how did they train you for this? Did you meet with representatives of the uh, insurance companies, or uh, did uh, people from HHS train you? How were you prepared to deal okay. with it? Okay, what you had to do as an agent, if you were going to sell on the so-called exchange, you had to take an online course. You had to pass the online course. It was based in about four different sections. Some of it was group insurance, some of it was individual. And then basically it was just a learning lesson about what's, you know, how people are going to be enrolled, what's going to be involved with it. And then you had to pass, you got a certificate, then you had to turn those into the different companies, which whole another thing started with that when some of the companies decided right at the end they weren't going to do it. Coventry let's, was one of them. And let's talk about that. Now here in Louisiana, this exchange is uh, uh, featuring not as many companies as we were led to believe. Correct. Basically, what do we find on the exchanges for people in Louisiana? Okay. On the exchange itself, because you can actually sell on exchange, you can sell off exchange. On exchange, from what we understand, it's basically Blue Cross statewide. Okay, we're told that Humana's going to sell in just Jefferson Parish. Which is our viewers, okay. Okay, right. Um, there is another company up in the northern parishes that's just going to handle the north. And then there is a company called, the, or a group called the Louisiana Co-op. And I don't know anything about them or if they're going to be statewide. Okay, now how do you sell off the exchange? Okay, if you sell off the exchange, what's involved there is basically it's just like a paper application. You send it straight to the insurance company. They have to meet the certain requirements of the exchange, whether it be a gold plan, a silver plan, a bronze plan. However, the problem with that is that you cannot see if you will qualify for the subsidy. But then the other problem with that is even if you go to the exchange, you can't even find out if you're going to get your subsidy now either. Okay. So what will happen is a person who does not buy on the exchange, they may have the opportunity for a subsidy, but they're going to have to get with their accountant at the end of the year to see if they can get the credit back or whatever, that kind of way, through their taxes. And okay. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the process of going on the exchanges, because from what I have uh, understood from talking to a lot of people, it's been very difficult. Very difficult to log on, very difficult to actually sign up. Uh, is it getting any better? Uh, are, are the websites uh, becoming more... I guess, user-friendly. What's going on with the sites? Basically, as an agent right now, I have a list of names, not even bothering them or myself to even try to go on. We're, we have a, um, supposedly Blue Cross is coming up with a way for us to, to get on through their site or something that we're waiting on to try to go in that way. But as for going to healthcare.gov, we're not even wasting our time. I just basically tell my people, hey, I got your name down here when things clear. We'll try to take you on. If not, you have the option of doing a paper application. Right. You're not going to see what your subsidy is, but you can start that way. Now, uh, let's talk numbers if we could as far as rates go. Uh, a lot of people were led to believe that they were going to be saving a lot of money uh, once Obamacare kicked in. Now at least some people are finding their rates are going up. What are we looking at here in Louisiana okay. rate-wise? You're looking at rates going up, and for this reason. In order to have an Obamacare plan or, you know, a patient affordability, whatever it's, I forgot what the term Affordable is. Affordable Care Act. Affordable Care Act is basically you have to take a minimum benefit package. The minimum benefit package is very rich. For example, as a woman, it's automatic maternity, automatic contraceptives, the whole thing. It's all kinds of mental health benefits, all types of things that most policies before did not have. Now what's happening is people realize, okay, well, great, I get all these benefits. Well, there's a cost that goes with that. Okay, now, yes, they did try to address that. That's what the exchange is for. You go on to the exchange, but you can't get on it, and you would find out that, yes, your premium's higher, but you get more benefits, but you're supposed to get the subsidy. 
So that's the next question is when you can't get a functioning exchange, right. you may be looking at and a premium. One of the things that had been sold to Americans was that there would be competition on that exchange. You could compare rates, correct? Depends on the state. See, that's the problem. Well, like here in Louisiana. Louisiana, we're pretty much uh, one to maybe, I don't know, there might be a second or a third, whereas they say that other states might have 15. But then yeah. I even heard there's a couple other states it's one carrier. So that's the problem with it is it's not as fluid as it so you did bring some rate information to share with us. Uh, tell mm -hmm. us what you have so far. Well, I mean, basically, I have some rates here from Blue Cross. And for example, if you had someone wanted a platinum plan, let's say you have uh, two 40 year olds, male, female, and they want a platinum and they have two children, be looking at a premium basically of about 400 per person for the 40 year olds. So you're looking at 800 there and then 200 roughly for two children, so that's a total of 400 there. So you're looking at a $1,200 premium for the top of the line And what plan. sort of deductible do you have? Uh, very little, like um, I think it's a, um, a $1,000 at the most, but it's okay. full of, it's got the copay, it's got the drug card, it's got right. everything that somebody may want. The problem is, can somebody stretch for 1200 Right. Now, the exchange is supposed to take care of that and say, okay, well, it's 1200 depending upon your income, we'll pitch in 600 of it. Or whatever. Let's but go on the other end of the spectrum, like an individual okay. who is buying his or her own insurance. Okay. And uh, that individual now has gotten a letter from their carrier that they're no longer covering those plans, correct? Sure. sure. Isn't for, that going on all it's over going the country? On, yes, it's going on right now. For example, on there is a plan with Blue Cross right now called Blue Value. It's a plan that I use myself personally. It's a catastrophic plan. It does not even come close to meeting the requirements of Obamacare. Okay, so that plan, either you're grandfathered in, which meant that you had the coverage before March 21st of 2010 when the law went in effect, that you had the coverage and did not make one change to it up until this point, then you're grandfathered, you can keep the plan. So when he said you can keep your plan, that is partly true. But what many people didn't realize is that if you changed your plan between this three-year gap, even by a small copay, you ungrandfathered, and now you're subject to the Obamacare. So the blue value, which was sort of a minimum plan, it's a catastrophic for an plan. individual would be costing X amount of dollars. Uh, for example, myself, it's 100, 112 bucks a All right. month. So now under Obamacare, that's going to be how much? Uh, easily four or five hundred dollars, and then hope for the subsidy. Okay, so that's a Increase of 500 percent, yeah. more or less, yeah. depending upon which plan. Now again, you're talking platinum, gold, silver. There's a lot of variations there. Right. But even to get to their minimum, probably you're looking at three something, or or 400, mm -hmm. roughly. So right now, in a, in a whole uh, sort of uh, position of flux, as, as an agent, it's a real challenge for you, isn't it? Well, it's yeah, it is. I mean, like I said, where I'm at right now is when I talk to people or people call me or I, you know, I have other people, it's basically you tell them, look, there's nothing we can do right now. This thing, you know, unless you are certain that you're not going to get a subsidy or you want to get started, I have two clients in that situation, mm -hmm. that basically they can submit the paper application they can get the premium that's on the sheet and they'll, but again, I have many people that would be subject to a possible subsidy, but again, can't find that out because of the situation with the website. Now, let's talk about our business owners here. They received a um, exemption to this for a year, correct? So Okay, now again, you have to clarify that though. It is under 50, so 50 and above have to provide the coverage, and yes, they got a one-year exemption. So yes. it's 50 and above. Okay, so some employers that I'm hearing about are cutting their workforce to below 50. Oh, sure. So that they're oh, not going to be uh, absolutely. involved in this at all, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, they, they, um, many of the, in the fast food business, like somebody owns multiple, for example, subway stations. What they're doing, because all their subway stations are under one corporation, so they might have between five different ones, they might have 60 employees. Mm -hmm. They're cutting them back to under 30 hours a week because that's another threshold too. So that's, uh, they could be moving some employees from full-time to part-time. They are, they already have yeah. started that. As a way of really avoiding Correct. Obamacare Correct, because it's, it's only employees 30 hours and above count towards the 50. Right. 
So those employers uh, that have 50 or more employees, they've got a year, though, to get ready for this, right? They've got a year, or they cut back to 29 hours, which right. some of them have already done. So. Mm -hmm. And as far as the doctors, uh, I know you're dealing with a lot of people in the medical uh, profession. What is their reaction to all well, this? Well, this is another problem coming too because some of the things they're doing is they're putting cuts on the Medicare and the Medicaid and to the hospitals to do this. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of people don't realize that part of Obamacare is to, is to shovel a lot more people into Medicaid. For example, if you go on to the exchange and you don't have an income, I think for one per, for an individual, it's like twelve thousand. You're going to automatically be routed to Medicaid, and you're going to be put into Medicaid whether you wanted it or not. So that's another provision there is that they are going to massively expand the Medicaid. Now, roles. if you're currently on Medicaid, you don't qualify no. for Obamacare. No. If you're currently on Medicare, you don't qualify. Okay, Medicare is sixty-five and above. Right. Right. So if you're on Medicaid, but if, you're on you, Medicare, if we're talking a person who right. does not have coverage right now, mm -hmm. they go to the exchange site, right, and they find out that they not only don't get a subsidy, but they didn't have enough qualifying income. They are going in Medicaid. Period. They're being routed to it and enrolled. Right. Simple as now, that. Are, now, and the some doctors are telling me well, that they they don't want to take as many Medicaid well, patients. Well, and and for example, I have a couple of clients of doctors, and the first thing they said is, you know, look, we we can't keep being chinsed by Medicaid. I mm -hmm. think Medicaid on a hospital bill, I mean, not on hospital, on doctor visit, they pay fifty percent of what the going rate is. Now, as far as uh, this whole, uh, I guess, uh, Medicare Advantage, uh, I'm hearing that there could be uh, some changes to Medicare well, Advantage. Well, from, from what we could see and what the Obamacare plan did is it's trying to push people away from the Medicare Advantage plans. Mm -hmm. And also they may be, as time goes on, that they do not get the funding that they used to get. So right. it's going to be a situation where those plans, I think they say another three to four years is when you're going to really now, see. Another possibility we hear is that this could be a transition to what's called a single payer system. Do you think that is, is a likely well, scenario? Well, I think that that was his main goal. There's mm -hmm. no question. I mean, it would have been easy to make a single payer, let the government pay for it. Right. But again, he couldn't get that through Congress. Right. So yes, that is his goal. But look at the fight he has now, just getting this thing going. The idea of going to single payer, the votes aren't there. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that, that is the goal. For if sure, there are problems sure. with this, uh, one option would be to scrap it. Another option would be to say, hey, we need to go to a single payer system to make it easier. How are you going to get the votes for that? But sure, that'll be the next, yeah. the next step. Say, well, let, you know, let's just turn it into like Medicare. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets the same plan, same deductibles. Right. You know, but and that would be where a are you going to get the money? That would be a similar plan to what Canada has and some sure. of the European countries sure. have. Sure. But where are you going to get the money? Mm -hmm. yeah, and where are you, the, the fight for that is going mm -hmm. to be on, on more than brutal. Now, uh, the cost of this, I've heard estimates anywhere from a trillion dollars to three trillion dollars. Do we have any good handle on now, that? The, you've got so many factors involved in it, too. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the one thing I don't think people understand about Obamacare is, is that there's assumptions built into the law. Mm -hmm. They have to get a certain number of people enrolled to create these so-called insurance pools, and they have to get a certain number of healthy people, mm -hmm. and they have to keep them in the pool. Let's say a viewer out there is like, hey, I don't want to deal with that. I'm going to go through the paperwork. I don't want to give my information. I'm worried about the, the hacking into the site. I'm worried about security. I'll just pay a penalty. So that's an option, right, for someone sure. to uh, just, and, and what are the penalties going to be? Well, the first year, and, and they're finding out that a lot of the young people have already made that choice, pay the $95 penalty okay. out of your tax refund. It's only if you get a tax refund can they pull the $95 for the penalty. But then that penalty is going to increase as it time It will goes increase, on. right. It will increase. I think mm. it steps up by another $50 for yeah. every year or something. So I think it caps out two fifty dollars or something like that in four years or something. Could there be some people going on and saying, hey, this is great. We're going to save money, or we're going to be covered when before we couldn't get covered. Well, sure. If they have a, if they get a perfect subsidized situation, or they end up on Medicaid, then it's free to them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Or let's say people with pre-existing conditions sure. who couldn't get coverage. Sure. This is going to be great for them, right? Because then they're going to be able to say, "Hey, I'm covered." Correct. But you see, that's another thing that you don't know is here in Louisiana, we had what's called the Louisiana Health Guarantee Association, and those people had that option. We even had a state plan that did that. So this is almost, in a way, kind of duplicative. Right. That and Louisiana is handling this whole thing different from some states, right? Correct. Each state is sort of doing this differently? Well, it's basically the state can run the exchange, or they can opt to the federal government. 
So that, that's what Louisiana and did. And Louisiana opted to the uh, federal the government. The federal government. Let them take it and figure it but out. But a lot of states are doing it on their own, right? They are. Greg, fascinating uh, topic. I appreciate all the information. No uh, certainly, you're going to be a busy guy for the next uh, so. few months Thanks so. yeah, as this yeah. thing develops. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Greg Reinhardt. Appreciate no it. When we come back, some good news in our local business world right here on Louisiana Business Spotlight. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now some good news in our local business world. Seizing on one of the longtime business strengths of the New Orleans area, the Idea Village Entrepreneurship Group is launching a food challenge for culinary startups. It's a nine-week coaching program with a food demonstration in December in which two teams will be chosen for showcasing during the New Orleans Entrepreneur Week Business Festival in March. Here in Jefferson Parish, public schools continue to show steady improvement, scoring, and overall B grade for 2012-2013, and that's according to school performance scores recently released. The parish had just four failing schools down from 18 a year earlier. Now this year, the State Department of Education changed their school performance formula to take into account ACT scores for high school students and to rely more heavily on standardized testing in elementary and middle schools. And finally, New Orleans economic recovery continues to steadily improve, though not quite as quickly as it was moving three months ago. Now, a study just released by the Brookings Institution ranked the city sixth in the recovery rate among the nation's 100 largest metropolitan areas. That was down from a fourth place ranking in July, but still pretty impressive. Okay, if you have any ideas or comments about topics or potential guests here on Louisiana Business Spotlight, please contact me at jcruer at gmail.com. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jeff Cruer, and I'll see you next time for another edition of Louisiana Business Spotlight.